up to about four o'clock, I knew nothing. The news had broken, and I was later on told at three o'clock, BBC had already announced the death. My daughter was returning from uh, um, Dubai and arrived and got the information. And so she panicked, immediately came home and organized to have my phone stolen. <laughs> she took them away. So I knew nothing. So after about four o'clock, people started pouring into my home. And there I was being told for the first time that Komla was at the end of his earthly pilgrimage. It was tough. But I rejoiced because I had a special relationship with Komla. He and his brother were not just sons. They became my brothers because I was not so well privileged to have brothers from my father and mother. So they became you know, my close friends. They replaced all those that I needed. And so the relationship from their very beginning was son, father, but brothers at work. And as we were told, we were an academic family. And nothing I could give to them was more important than education. And in fact, my father was a pioneer in the Catholic education project in the Volta region and helped to build schools all over the place. And so he will always tell you that, look, I don't have gold. We have coconut plantations around the place. But that's not going to satisfy you. We have a lot of fishermen out there, and the business is rough. And therefore, you end up drinking Akbatishi. If you know what I mean. It, it, it shakes your system. <laughs> you know. So that, that, that's not going to satisfy you. And of course, I went to a school, Bishawama College. Those who know Bishawama College is a school where discipline is everything. And so I tried, together with my late wife, who was the daughter of uh, uh, a schoolmaster, a versatile musicologist, composer of our national anthem. She was, you know, my soulmate. So I don't want to, you know, sing her praises here. But with the support that I got from her, you know, we gave them the best that we could give. We were so close that uh, sometimes Komla will take a child, uh, you know, at us, but for fun, you know, at us. And I remember on one occasion, well, it was Mother's Day, and we were all invited. My, my late wife was then, you know, uh, pre pretty much ill, and I had to take her in the wheelchair to a hotel for this function. And Komla was hosting the program, and uh, as he was introducing all other people, he said, Oh, let me introduce my mother. And she went on to say, he went on to say, well, you know, my mother is a democratic, <laughs> a democratic tyrant. <laughs> and by the way, my father is a democratic dictator. <laughs> or he would call me, you know, uh, when he was in BBC, for example, he would call me and say, hey, dad, how is it with you? How is your love life? I said, are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> but what I see is clearly that they bought into certain core values. And they lived those values. And I think that is really what could God come out to where he is, or where he was. There is a certain cast of mind, which I saw in Kobla, for example. He loves dogs. And one day he brought a puppy into the house and gave the dog the name Bigger. So I called him and said, where is this one coming from? He said, oh, Dad, don't you remember that book you used for teaching racism in American life? I said, oh, you mean? Um, Richard Wright's book, Native Son? He said, yeah. 
The main character in that book is Bigger Thomas, who was overwhelmed by the predominant racist culture to the extent that he couldn't cope. And he ended up in jail, having murdered the daughter of the person he was working for. I forgot completely about this story until recently when I was reviewing some of the um, videos on, on him. And he was giving an interview. And the question was, if you were to choose a book which influenced you so deeply, what book would you choose, select? And there he was saying, Native Son. So you can see the connection. And during the time we were here, of course, uh, Koshi would say, I didn't give them room for anything else. But I took them through roots. If you remember the, uh, the, the story of uh, uh, Kunta Kinte, who saw himself slowly losing his freedom, slowly losing his dignity, and his self-respect all slowly easing into slavery. And of course, I remember Koma asking, so in a situation like this, how do you cope? And he was a young seven-year-old in a racial environment, a racially polarized environment. And as Koshi was saying, they were just the three children in that environment. So their conditioning forces were clear. And so the questions went on and on and on. And when he got into Joy FM, he went with a passion of questioning everything. And I remember a situation where he found himself having to confront the inequalities in our society, or what I call in sociological terms, the concentration of wealth as, op as opposed to the dispersion of wealth. And he said, something must be wrong. SNIT, you know, the biggest uh, social security system that should support our country, our people, was being used to enrich the few in the society. He had the courage to confront this. And of course, those who didn't like it were up in arms. And I remember I couldn't take it. And I had to drive to my spiritual director, Monsignor Pueblo, at the time, tears in my eyes, and said, they are out to get him. He had to go underground. We had to develop mechanisms to protect him. That's a society in which moral crusaders were saying that the system we have brought will change and it will be in the interest of the people. So I called Komla after my interaction with Monsignor. That Komla, what shall we do? What can we do under the circumstances? <laughs> he looked at me and said, hey, my dad, you know, you have to have the courage to face these challenges. If you want me to back off, say so. <laughs> and he went on to say, if we do this investigation to its logical conclusion, it will end in the bedrooms of certain people you can never believe will do these things. And as usual, we engaged in some debates, and I said, what is the basis on which you are acting this way? He said, well, Dad, can you take the Constitution? I said, I've read the Constitution several times over. I just tell me what you're talking about. He said, refer to Chapter 7, the Directive Principles of State Policy. That clause, or that section, sorry, that section in the Constitution is meant to protect the interests of the generality of the population. And so any good broadcast journalist must use that as the measurement indicators as to whether the government is doing what is right or what is wrong. I'm afraid many of his colleagues were not in a position to do that. And so in spite of the fact that he is gone, I'm so happy that he had the courage to stand up 
And indeed, I didn't know that Kamala was going to die so soon. So when he was in uh, France, just before Mandela passed away, I called him and I said, Kamala, you know what? I'm not your boss, but you have to pack your things and be on the way to South Africa. I'm already <laughs> on the way to South Africa. I said, fine. And then I sent him an email. And this was, in fact, a tribute that I had written for Nelson Mandela. And I said to him that you may choose to use it or put it on your Facebook when you return to London. And I want to share that with you. I didn't know that I was going to use part of this as a tribute to myself. So I want to share this with you. Nelson Mandela was a great African confessor a confessor for African liberation. He had heroic courage to travel the tortoise and an easy road to freedom. This icon did not die for himself, but for all who sought and are still seeking ways to achieve the emancipation of Africa, and to give voice to the despised people, the weak, the poor, and those written out of history. He gave Africa a new hope a new challenge to reaffirm itself in world affairs. Mandela took the history of the human race in his hands and sought to transform its conscience so that the good in God's creation may prevail. Mandela became, in his personal adversity, the moral compass for the world, and we will be missing a great gift to humanity. So as I hear people, market women in Ghana, young men and women crying because Komla passed away, I felt there is a new challenge of hope, a new challenge of faith that God is asking us today to follow and make sure that this place we call Africa stands in world history the way it should be. Komla moved out of uh, Joy FM to BBC. And as you listen to him, he was equally concerned about the progress that is being made, but the uneven development that was also occurring at the same time. And so he was raising fundamental issues, not different from the questions that he was raising as a radio broadcaster in Ghana. So again, the issue came up in our discussions. And I said, now, if you're raising these things continentally, what is your foundation? Again, as it was usual, he said, well, Daddy, you know, uh, there is a document the African Union has produced. Everything is in that inside there. The basis for an African broadcast journalist seeking to speak on behalf of the continent. It's all inside that document. I said, oh, I've also read, you know. So I uh, you know, said, well, well let's, let's talk about that. And he was referring to the African Charter of Human and People's Rights. And in that document, there was an emphasis on the right to development. And so for me, Komla was raising a fundamental issue of the right to development. The right to development constitutes the precondition for democratic governance. So if we cannot, as you know, socialists will say, if you know I'm hungry, how can I be talking about you know, the rule of law? It's so important. And no country in the world has achieved democratic status, democratic ethos and practice without making sure the majority of the people are well catered for. And for him, he was going you know, in the direction of great men who have started a journey. His Excellency mentioned uh, you know, uh, Nkrumah. Nelson Mandela spoke about it. Tabo Mbeki spoke about it. And in fact, there was a book that I used in one of my courses, and uh, it's uh, Amika Cabral, Return to the Source. 